Um, so next we have another fireside, fireside chat titled Diversity and Inclusion's Impact on Multicultural Marketing. And this fireside chat is gonna be moderated by Professor Eric Tancre, um, another professor that I love, even though he coached the opposite or the other, <laughs> the other Rutgers team. <laughs> Good. You guys hear me? Okay, great. All right. So we have uh, Ashini here. Hey, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very well. Um, well, let's get started. Um, it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce you to uh, Sebastiani uh, Nadaraj, is the Executive Global Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at VMLYNR, and she had recently uh, was the ACE Awards 2001, I mean 2021, excuse me, Champion of Diversity Honoree. And uh, so she, <clears throat> since moving into this role, she has worked tirelessly to ensure all employees feel welcome, safe, and heard by building cross-cultural communication and reducing cultural-based uh, prejudice and inequality from instituting new programs to fostering partnerships to taking full advantage of talent pools and pathways. Uh, she has made it her mission to promote diversity at VMLYNR and increase cultural literacy, awareness, acceptance within the agency and across agency partnerships. And that's one of my questions we'll get to as we finish uh, telling your, your uh, fabulous biography is the connection to design, which we'll get to as I think we'll start as our first question. But uh, prior to this role, she was an artist by nature and by trade with a master's in commercial design. And uh, she worked with uh, client teams to provide design and branding counsel. And throughout the course of her tenure, transformed the design department into one of VMLY and R's most prominent and celebrated units. Okay, previously she served as creative director for the retail digital merchandising team at Hallmark and held roles across print, advertising, television at River City Studio, Bernstein and Ryan, Blacktop Creative. And she worked closely with household brand names, some, some which you should know Walmart, McDonald's, Sprint, Bear, Kansas City Zoo, Kansas City Power Light District, Disney, and a few others. Okay, so she believes that art and design are, are storytelling vehicles, which we'll get into in a minute. And Ron, I mean, she is not, um, she also teaches as adjunct professor at Kansas City Art Institute and University of Central Missouri, where she taught branding, guerrilla marketing, and design systems. And so, um, to simply say, it's a pleasure to have you with uh, us today. And to have this, uh, I was looking forward to this conversation. And uh, let me start with the first question. I thought I was going to start with a quote, and I had sent you the questions. I'm going to start a little differently this time. I have other questions I listed. Um, in your background, you talk about uh, design and your experience with the previous in, in commercial design. How has that uh, influenced your approach? Well, actually, before we get to that, we revise that question. How do you define, from your experience in your role, in the current role, executive director, uh, you know, the, the DE&I space? How do you see it? Well, first, um, thank you for having me. Um, and forgive me if I'm not hearing the questions correctly, but but I, I'll ask you if I, if I feel like I've missed it. Um, but thank you for having me this afternoon and, and um, to all the audience today, um, thank you for having me as well. Um, so kind of to your question, um, you know, it certainly has the, 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 the space where I work today, which is the DEI space, and with my background as, as, as an artist, as a designer in my heart, um, I first see myself as an artist and everything that I do, the way that I think the, or find solutions or strategize or empathize or even see humility um, comes from the heart and soul of, through the lens of a creative thinker. Um, but first, let me tell you how I got this role. I, I have been a designer, as you heard on my um, bio, from my bio, my whole life. And about three and a half years ago, I had a pivot in my career. So wanting to really find ways to help people reconcile differences and connect in more meaningful ways 
So I took on the role as a, as a, um, a global executive director of our DEI practice at VML YNR. And the DEI space isn't new to me at all. I have been involved for about 20 years and just now getting actually paid for it, meaning it's a full-time job. And previously, it was all, you know, voluntary basis. So, and it's, I have to say, it was the best career move that I ever made and realized every day that the 30 years of design experience that I had was a mere prerequisite to the work that I do today. So it was a great opportunity in the name of unconventional um, leadership to give me, to give me, you know, the opportunity to actually um, contribute at this level. So our chief people officer, who is my manager today, broke the rules of conventional hiring and saw an opportunity in someone like myself um, with my kind of background to serve in an HR space. So through the lens, um, I'm an advocate for DEI and, and, and you know, I'm using the gifts that I have as, as an artist, as a designer, and, and to see words, to understand the impact of colors, um, shapes, design elements to make a difference. And it adds that another layer of a, a greater sense of purpose in the work that I do today. So one of the most important things about my role is as a DEI practitioner is to encourage getting comfortable being uncomfortable. And if you think about it in the world of design, a lot of times we are encouraging people to see things differently, to see products differently. And some of us will be like, no, I don't like that because I, I, I prefer the old method of the ways that it was designed, but it's this evolution of humankind or um, that, that we need to, to be part of as, as the world is evolving. And so part of that design comes into that, that sense of mindset of evolution. Therefore, I'm learning more about where people, the people's hearts are. So I get to, I get, do get design homesick. Um, it's kind of a bittersweet um, um, uh, pivot that I had, but indeed I use my design and creative thinking every day to solve DEI issues. Solving humanity with an artist's brain is um, actually really wonderful. Well, that kind of reminds me of something in our conversation before the event, and I showed you a story about um, one of the firms that impressed me also in the design space, Ideo, one of the top design firms in the world. In fact, they had evolved from going to simply product design into more of designing for social change, social purpose, and, for, and see solve design as having a higher calling. Um, I'm going to ask you a different question I didn't have prepared because because you, you you kind of brought it to mind. Um, how has how did did when you joined the firm did they envision the role the way you had seen the role or did uh, with your uh, background in, in design were you able to impact the role in the way you see the world? And so you, you across your bio you talked about the human centric philosophy. How much it was the firm? saying that we, we envision this role to be this way or how much was it guided by, guided by your vision and your experience? I think it's a combination of two things. I think it's a combination of coming in. Um, I came from a background of, of creative direction in my previous role, which was uh, at Hallmark. And at Hallmark, I was leading the design space for visual merchandising. So I, if, if anything that I learned about humanity and understanding the human heart, I have to say that I, I kind of pay not to, to my experience of seven years of experience in Hallmark, really understanding the human heart, really understanding multiculturalism, you know, um, that even colors actually have an impact on the way communities think. Even colors have an impact in the way that shapes the way that I receive information, whether it's from a product or whether it is from visual merchandising or even if the clothes that I'm wearing, you know. Um, for example, a very good example I'm gonna give you is the color red. So when you think of red in, in, in Western culture, you think of red as, as you know, something that is um, probably alerting you um, uh, with, with like, um, uh, um, alarming you of something and you know that's why our stop sign is red or it, it gives you some sort of a strong navigation of somewhere to go to um, which is why you know the red cross is red and it also has 
you know, a, a, an incredible stopping power. And that's all that it is in, in, in the Western culture. But when you look into the Eastern culture and the Eastern philosophy, red in some countries could mean something really negative. It could mean blood. It could mean something that is dangerous. Um, it could also mean in some countries, it could be prosperity. Um, in, the, in the Chinese culture, it is seen as prosperity. So really understanding who are you talking to, what your consumers are receiving, the message that you're receiving, and also thinking about the triggering sensation that some of these shapes and fonts and photography and design elements and colors and even words that actually mean different things to different communities and people or generations for that matter. Um, the word joy means very differently. The word love means very differently. I remember when I was in Hallmark, we, we, we did an ad for Mother's Day and we put the word love, like love your mother this Mother's Day or something like that. And when we did the focus group and a group of people, especially from the, uh, um, the black community said, they found that very condescending. Um, and meaning you are asking me to love my mother, which means you assume that I don't love my mom already. And who are you to tell me how to love my mom? Um, but then other cultures would think that, oh, that's an aspiration. So, so really thinking about that the word as simple as love actually can mean so many, um, um, uh, a magnitude of so many um, significance and symbolism to different cultures. So really coming back to so sorry, really coming back to, sorry, really coming back to understanding um, the when I came over to VML YNR and, and my role as a, a director of design was to add purpose into design so that it is just not about pretty pictures and sexy pictures and, and things that actually entice you from a kind of a um, eye candy way, but rather it is things that actually have a deep sense of meaning and, and, and why there is a why and a purpose behind anything that is part of a design solution. So with that, I kind of had that pivot of going into the diversity, equity, and inclusion naturally because I've already was doing this and I wanted to take it one step further. And when the opening came for this role and when I applied for it, um, I found it, um, it was a natural uh, progression. How much of the, uh, well, that's a great, thank you for sharing that, that was fascinating. How much of the, um, when you find you're, you're going into your new role, um, when, you approach, when you approach organizations and, and they're looking at DE and I, how much of it is they look at it as a very stereotypical, you know, a, a view of DE and I, and how much of it is a certain degree of educating the organizations that this is evolving and things like that. How do you approach that with organizations so they're mindful of, you know, how they're interpreting it and how they should interpret it and so forth? Um, sorry, I'm having a hard time listening. Um, but then I think I understand your question. The question is, uh, if I may repeat, is how. What are we doing in our organizations, in, respectively in organizations that champion DEI um, and, and create a space for us to improve DEI, correct? Am I right or wrong? That's correct. And, and, and yeah. the same point of, you know, organizations, you know, many organizations want to do better, you know, is, is where they, I guess, where are they lacking, whether it's in terms of their mindset or in terms of their actions. And how does, yeah. how does the, your role in the organization help bridge that for them? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna talk about um, a little bit about our organization and, 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 and then maybe we can kind of um, uh, answer a little bit of, of, of what you're asking. So, you know, it's always a practice that, that you cannot teach humility, kindness, gratitude or compassion, sympathy or even empathy. But, 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 but truly we believe that you can inspire others to want to develop these skills for themselves. Um, so kind of like in, in that mindset, um, you know, the work that I do centers around the work of being a change agent at our agency at BML YNR, just creating transformative spaces that facilitates personal 
and communal growth in our employees, our organizations, and even our clients to the extent of even kind of spilling over and being a catalyst to our community outside the walls of VML YNR. And I think it's really, really important for us to know that when we take care of our people within the walls of VML YNR, that we are a catalyst to the communities. And that way, immediately you are seen as an authentic space, because you're not doing it for optic reasons, you're doing it for the people, people come first, then comes the agency and what we would actually um, tout on our websites and things like that. So we have to take care of our people first. So from there, we have to really understand where is our authentic power and where do we stand genuinely. Um, then immediately we're opening doors to to recruitment because people are seeing us very differently in the space that we are in. So by doing that, we're tapping into the power of storytelling, uncovering diverse perspectives and shared experiences within the walls of VML YNR itself and using that power to inspire, to educate and create a community that is actually rooted in empathy and understanding. And in order for us to do that, we first have to have a mission. We have to have a mission that our agency, this is what we stand for and this is what we pledge for. So it's almost like a policy that we built for our community. And we're engaging people on a, on a, on a daily basis, whether they are um, coming to an event and listening, it's a listening session or participating in a conversation, a dialogue um, in an open discussion, safe space environment. It really doesn't matter. But, but, but all that matters is that we're creating that safe space. So I think it's really important for us to understand the work across the greater VML in our body is to really understand the idea of collaborating with the agencies, um, 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 employees within the agencies itself. So, so therefore like ERGs, giving them the, the, the space for them to feel that they can be themselves. So they can bring their best version to work. They can bring their most authentic version to work. On a larger scale, we also do DEI trainings and support the design and the curriculum that shapes our company's culture by aiding and planning and um, um, executing uh, programs for employees to partner with. So it's not about just executive directors actually coming up with programs and assuming that everybody actually will, will feel good about this, but instead we're actually reaching out to our people and asking our people, what is it that you would like to learn? What is it that you'd like to be part of? And what would you like, what areas would you like to contribute and raise your hands and be part of the decision making? I think with that, we can really foster an agency that, that pushes progress, an agency that is actually in the forefront of becoming um, a change agent ourselves. So I hope I've kind of um, expressed and answered your question. But hey, for um, I'm actually gonna go back to the quote that I listed earlier. And you maybe think about how I approach the question a little differently. It was a study from Deloitte and I can find it here. Uh, it's actually a very recent report just released last week. We found that 94% of Gen Z expects companies to take a stand on important social issues and 90% say they're more willing to purchase products that they deem beneficial to society. By creating loyalty within Gen Z also requires authenticity, which you just, we, were, we were just talking about. These younger consumers will notice that brands are making a genuine holistic effort to live DEI values. What my, I want you to comment on, comment on that, and I'm more specifically, do you feel that or you sense that Gen Zs get it more than previous generations in terms of the in terms of living the DEI values? Yeah, good, really good question. Uh, but before I answer that question, let me ground our thinking with the purpose with with the purpose of exercise. Um, we we must treat DEI as as though it, it is a practice of mindfulness. You know, similar to that of meditation or yoga, or any sort of sports that, that we put our heart and soul into it. And we, we practice and we, we discipline that muscle to think differently, to do differently. So as such, our work to reform our agency's sense of purpose 
by steeping into empathy and humility and instilling in us all the greater sense of collective purpose. We cannot do the work of DEI with just one or two people. It has to be a collective purpose. So within the purpose lies the understanding that everyone has the power to influence their communities and change their environment. So that itself allows generations, all the different generations, whether it's Gen Z or whether it's millennial, that they too have a part in shaping the culture of the community. Within that, within that itself lies the understanding that we as global citizens, um, or we call ourselves advocates or, or activists, or even when it comes to systemic injustice at hand, does that really impact all of us? But our generation tells us sometimes that that's the work of a different generation. So, to, so the power of collective is so important for us to kind of shape our future of the agency and to shape sustainable change. Um, with that in mind, the work we produce, the product we create comes from a very genuine place of anything that actually encompasses the holistic effects of a DEI value, like, you, like the question says. It has the authentic heartbeat because the space we are fostering centers around the essence of belonging. And so automatically it is kind of like seeped into the DNA of the organization. So the Me Too movement or anti-Asian hate crime that we have seen recently, or even Black Lives Matter or any movement comes to mind that the recent years have driven awareness of deep racial and gender inequality in equalities that run through society, right? So time after time, we have seen brands that miss the mark when it comes to being culturally mindful from like recent Prada, we can think about Burberry products to, um, I think the most famous one is Pepsi Kendall's, um, Pepsi uh, Kendall's Jenna ad, um, that brands lose sight of some of their audiences. And, and if you think about it, the messages that are being sent out, um, what is that message that we're sending out? We have to ask ourselves that first. So successful brands designed for today's consumers. They recognize that the modern definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion means much more than just race or gender. It encompasses everything under the world of isms, you know, um, ageism, sexual orientation, or sizeism, ableism, and, and countless other cultural and social groups. So brands like New Balance and Starbucks and Bumble have actually broken out and designed products that are inclusive that serves a greater power of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, just making sure that successful brands market and design for today's consumer. So Gen Zs and, and our millennial groups recognize that the modern definition of diversity, equity, and inclusion means much more than just race or gender. It actually talks about everything that I just mentioned, all the isms. Unlike other generations that are willing to actually embrace the difference um, differently, but then today's community, today's generation see consumer products um, um, uh, and, and, and is associated with the consumer's product in a very unique and individualistic point of view. They want the brands that support their point of view. They want the brands to reflect their own personalities. So Tom's and Airy are incredible brands that actually do um, uh, actually encompass and embrace the power of authenticity. But in the recent article of um, Aries, I believe a global brand precedent mentioned something like, you know, Aries has been a leader in empowering women and celebrating inclusivity and body positivity. So the newest bra uh, uh, campaign and actually the, the models in that bra campaign are part of a brand's ongoing commitment to show real genuine, authentic, unretouched women who are the core of everything that they do. So statement, statements such as this certainly shows the power of commitment and authenticity, and it shows how brand can influence literally something called um, retail diversity. Um, so it's really important that, that we pay attention to uh, the generations um, like the Gen Zs and the millennials because 
growing up and being surrounded by multicultural groups in their communities and their peers is bound to impact the way that they think. It's bound to impact consumer values. And, um, and hopefully that kind of answered the question that you were asking in a, in a long format. So that was very good. Do we have time for one more? What's our time? Yeah, we'll take Oh, okay, sorry. So, Sebastian, I appreciate your time. Uh, we were very enlightened by your talk and uh, certainly something that uh, will be, you know, enlightening for the future as well. But thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Are, are we out of time? Are we done? Out of time, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.